The suspicion on this woman came first of all when her husband died and later when her sister died. But what no one would know until many, many years later was that two of her daughters had also died and the doting mother had never told anyone. The question was, what was she trying to hide? This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. At 4.30am on the 17th of July 1984, a passerby was walking in Squaw Valley when they noticed a fire. They called emergency services to report the fire by the side of the stream, and when emergency services arrived, they pulled out the charred remains of a human body. This person had burns over 90% of their body. Forensic investigators determined that the fire had been started with gasoline, and that meant that this was intentional. The remains were found to be that of a woman, someone who was around 17 years of age, but there was no identification on the body, and so they just had to list this person as a Jane Doe. The remains had duct tape across the mouth, and it was clear that whoever it was had been shot, although the medical examiner determined that the gunshot was not a new wound and was likely something that had happened a little while ago. Based on those findings, a composite sketch was drawn and the unidentified teenager was given the identifier of Jane Doe 485884. It wasn't until nine years later when the authorities would receive a phone call helping them to connect the dots together and figure out exactly what had happened to Jane Doe 485884. To get there, we have to go all the way back to 1946, where we meet Teresa Cross, who was born in Sacramento, California. Her dad, Jim, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, and that meant that he couldn't work anymore, and so he moved back to the family house and was there full time. And Teresa was his main carer. She also was helped by her mum, Swanee, and her sister, Rosemary. Swanee passed away in 1961 from a heart attack, and Teresa was just 15 years old and this was incredibly sudden and unexpected. And so when Swanee died, Teresa felt like she lost her mum, she lost her whole life, she didn't know what she would do, she had no one to support her. It was around the time that Swanee died that Jim, Teresa's dad, became abusive and it got to the point where Teresa decided she didn't want to take anymore. She was 16 years old by this point, and so she decided to move out. They had all had to downsize because obviously her dad wasn't working and her mum wasn't around anymore. And so they'd moved out of the childhood home that Teresa had grown up in, and they'd moved to some rented accommodation. So Teresa didn't feel too sad to be leaving the abusive home. At 16 years of age, Teresa dropped out of school. She'd met a man, a 21-year-old man called Clifford, who was known as Cliff and the two started a relationship, and they actually got married pretty soon after that, but things were off to a rocky start pretty much straight from the beginning. Teresa was abusive towards Cliff, and Cliff was abusive towards Teresa, both physically and emotionally. By the time Teresa was 17, she had become pregnant with Cliff's child, and this was her first child. She soon gave birth to a little baby boy they called Howard, and so her sole focus then became looking after the family home and raising Howard, and she also became pregnant with her second child. But less than a year after the birth of Howard, and this was one day after Cliff Clifford's 23rd birthday, the couple began a really, really bad argument. Cliff was angry because Teresa was angry at him for having gone out on his birthday and spending time with his friends. She thought he should be at home helping her to raise Howard. Cliff decided he'd had enough of the arguments and the controlling nature of Teresa, and so he decided that he was going to leave. Now, the couple had had an argument very similar to this just two weeks before, and it had ended in a physical altercation where Cliff had struck Teresa. Teresa had called the police and they'd come out, but she had eventually decided to not press charges because Cliff agreed that he would be leaving the family home. So at some point, it seemed like this was what she wanted. This time, Teresa knew Cliff was being serious and she, in a fit of rage and hurt, she reached down towards the ground where there was a gun lying by the side of her. And as Cliff went towards the door to leave, she pulled that gun up and faced him and she fired one single shot. Immediately after that, Teresa made her way down the street and she went to the sheriff's house. It was really close by, it was just at the end of her road. And she went and she told him straight away that she'd shot her husband. But in a twist of a lie, she told the sheriff that 
Cliff had been the one to pick up the gun and he was threatening her and he actually hit her with the gun. She said she managed to wrestle it off him and then she shot him in the hand. And with that, the sheriff escorted Teresa back to her house. And at this point, he thought that it was probably just a flesh wound and that Cliff would be okay. But he soon realized that wasn't the case at all. When he arrived at the house, he found Cliff on the floor and saw that he had a gunshot wound to his torso. And what had happened is that the gunshot had gone through his hand and into his torso and it had been fatal. Teresa was arrested right there and then and taken to the station for questioning. And that's when she told them a different story about what had happened with Cliff. She said there hadn't actually been a physical altercation between her and Cliff. Instead, he started to get angry and threatened to hurt her. And with that, she blacked out when she woke up she was holding the gun and Cliff had been shot and he was on the floor. The officers questioning Teresa did not believe her and so the case went to trial. And at trial, Cliff's sister was called to testify and she said that this had all happened before, a few months before the fatal murder of her brother. She had been around the house when Teresa had threatened to shoot Cliff and she'd actually tried but thankfully she'd missed. However, obviously that wasn't the case this time. This time she succeeded and Cliff was dead. Cliff's sister said this was probably planned. Teresa, by this point very much pregnant with Cliff's child, used the defense that she had very much been an abused wife and she was just defending herself. And her defense really presented the domestic violence as the reason um, she had killed Cliff on this day and the fact that she was only defending herself. And she went on to say that she was pregnant with his second child and she would now have to go on to raise both children on her own. And this defense actually worked. She was found not guilty. She was not responsible for her actions and she was freed. And after the verdict was announced, Donald Dorfman from the DA's office in Sacramento said that the jurors ran over to Teresa, some in tears, and they hugged her, saying how glad they were that she was found not guilty. And so Teresa was released. And the very next day, Teresa headed straight back to the DA's office to retrieve her gun. Then, in March of 1965, Teresa gave birth to that second child, this time a baby girl who she called Sheila. Once she had baby Sheila, she moved in with a new man she was dating in Rio Linda. So it was this new man, Teresa, Sheila and her first child Howard. But it soon became clear to this man that Teresa was using him as a means of free childcare. She would leave the two children with him and then she would go out drinking. And when he discovered that Teresa was cheating on him, she was having an affair, he decided that he didn't want that and so he left and she had to look after the children on her own. But in true Teresa fashion, as I'll come on to talk about a bit later, she didn't want to do that. And so she started going out and looking for someone else to help her look after the children. And that's when she met a man called Robert Knorr. And she and Robert would go on to have an extremely abusive and toxic relationship. And this was fueled by both of their drinking problems. In the midst of this mess, she and Robert ended up getting married and they also had another child together. Um, and this child was a little baby girl who they called Susan. They went on to have three more children. First, a boy who they called William or Billy Bob. The second, another boy called Robert Jr. And the third, a little baby girl called Terry. Teresa seemed to have something against Susan from the moment she was born. She didn't connect with her in the way that she connected with her other children. And that's not to say that she had a good relationship with her other children. It was the fact that she targeted Susan specifically. She would call her a devil worshipper and say that she was evil. Life was not easy by any means for the family. This is a family of eight living in a small two bedroomed house. So there's four people in each room. And because of the abuse that they're suffering from both their mum and their dad, and the abuse that the mum and dad are doing towards one another, the kids just struggle to form any kind of genuine bonds with each other or with their mum and dad. It wasn't long before this kind of lifestyle just didn't suit Robert anymore and so he decided to leave and he started divorce proceedings with Teresa. Teresa went on to get married twice more and things would spiral even more out of control, especially due to her drinking. With this and the feeling of losing control, which is something that will come up again and again in this case, Teresa learned that her eldest son, Howard, 
the little boy who had been in the room when she Teresa had shot Cliff, the baby's dad, he started to exhibit some pretty horrific behaviour. Teresa found out that he had been abusing both the youngest children, Robert Jr. and Terry. And as a result of that, Teresa was furious with Howard and she actually ended up abusing him because of this. This doesn't make a huge amount of sense, it, but it turns out that it was nothing to do with the abuse that Howard was inflicting on the youngest two children, but more so about the control that she felt she had lost given that Howard was now abusing his two youngest siblings. Meanwhile, all of the children started attending school and that's where they would find their normalcy, especially in comparison to their home life, which was just incredibly turbulent and toxic. One day, Terry, the youngest daughter, had gone out to school and she told her friend that they didn't really have money for new clothes. In fact, they didn't have a lot of clothes at all. Obviously, there are six kids living in this house at this point. And later on that day, the friend's mum came round to the house, the family house, and she knocked on the door, Teresa answered, and the mum said that she had some spare clothes and her daughter and Terry were talking earlier, and she thought that Terry might find the use for some of these clothes that her daughter had grown out of. Teresa thanked the woman and said goodbye, but as soon as the woman left, she called for Terry to come to her where she was at in the house. She grabbed her hair, she screamed at her that they weren't a charity case, and then she dragged Terry through the house by her hair. She then tied Terry to one of the downstairs doors, she made her two sons hold her in place, and then she whacked her with a stick. Teresa would continue to use her sons to help her carry out the abuse of the other children over the following few years. And this didn't mean that they were immune to that abuse, not at all. But they found that if they helped their mum, they were much less likely to get abused in the same way as their as the three sisters, Sheila, Susan and Terry. And that's when Howard, the eldest of the children, actually had to take over charge of looking after his siblings. It wasn't necessarily because he wanted to, but if he didn't do it, no one would. And so he became in charge of making sure that they had food and clothing and that they went to bed at night. Teresa was extremely depressed and angry during this time. And she actually had a plank of wood that she wrote Board of Education on and she would use this to hit the children. Slowly, Teresa's focus shifted away from abusing Howard and towards her three daughters almost exclusively. Teresa was constantly angry with Sheila, Susan and Terry, and she was convinced that the three of them were sexually active, even though she had no evidence of this, and the girls sure weren't gonna open up and tell her about their private lives. Sheila, the eldest of the three daughters, was only 13 at this point, and by all accounts, she was a well-behaved, well-mannered, kind and considerate young girl. She lived in constant fear of doing anything wrong and being punished for it, and the fact that she would go out of her way to disobey her mum just wasn't something that her sisters thought she would have done. They thought that Teresa was targeting her specifically. Teresa's obsession with her daughters being sexually active was centered around them then not having an education, but this made no sense because she had made all of her children drop out of school by the time they were aged 14. Of course, having dropped out of school, this meant that none of the children were receiving any kind of social interaction or education of any kind. And it actually meant that obviously they were at home more often and so more prone to the beatings. By this point, Howard was still living at the house, the eldest son, but he was starting to explore the outside world a little bit more. And the more he started to explore, the more he realized that the abuse his mum was doing to his siblings and had done to him was by no means normal. It was in fact completely abnormal. And it got to the point where he returned home one day and he told her he wasn't taking it anymore. And not only was she not gonna hurt him, but she wasn't gonna be hurting the siblings of him anymore either. Now, Teresa couldn't do much about this. At this point, Howard's a big lad, he's six foot, and he definitely could overpower Teresa if he wanted to. So Teresa had no point but to agree to this. However, she only agreed to it when Howard was around. As soon as Howard left the house to go to work or to go and hang out with his friends, the abuse would happen again and often more harshly. Even when the abuse wasn't physical in terms of actually beating the children, 
she would exert her power in other ways, such as making the three girls overeat, she said, so that they would get fat and would be less sexually attractive to boys. Teresa married that third husband, they divorced, and then a fourth husband, Chet Harris. And after their inevitable divorce, she told the children that she was more convinced than ever that Susan was a witch. She said that Chet, her ex-husband, her fourth husband, had made Susan a witch. One time, she actually pulled one of Susan's teeth out. And this was so horrific that it led to Susan actually being able to manage to get out and to escape the hell house. When police picked her up, they saw the injuries and they took her to the hospital. Susan was completely honest and she complained to the doctors that she'd been suffering regular beatings by her mum for years. She begged to be taken out of the family home and put into care, but that didn't happen. She did spend a little bit of time in a psychiatric hospital, but it wasn't long before the authorities spoke to Teresa about what Susan had said and they asked if it was true. Teresa obviously denied it, saying instead that Susan was and always had suffered with mental health issues and that's what made her say ridiculous things like that. How she excused the very obvious injuries that they'd found on Susan, there's no information on, but somehow she did and Susan was placed back into her mum's care. Teresa then forced Susan to corroborate her story and tell child services that she had been lying and her mum wasn't abusive at all. And of course, when they returned home, Teresa was furious with Susan and subjected her to the most horrific beatings. What child services didn't know at the time, but would find out many years later, was that Susan had been beaten so badly in her stomach that she'd actually developed an ovarian tumour. And it was at this point that Teresa told Susan things were going to change, there were going to be some changes around the house. She needed to be punished for what she'd done, for the fact that she'd escaped and the fact that she'd told the authorities what her mum had done. Teresa started starving Susan of food and water. The average human can go just three days without water and Susan would be deprived of all water up until the point where she was on the edge of death and then Teresa would give her the water. The physical abuse continued and Teresa would try and convince her other children that Susan deserved this, she deserved to be punished and it was all because of this devil inside her. Anything that happened to her was her fault, she said. And then one day, who knows why, Teresa pulled out a gun, she got Susan to stand on the other end of the room and she shot her in the chest. And by way of a miracle, Susan didn't die. She was hurt, really badly hurt, but she was alive. And then Teresa got her other two daughters to bring Susan into the bathtub. She put her in the bathtub. And then she spent the next four weeks actually nursing her back to health. It didn't make a lot of sense. She'd literally just shot her daughter, but she decided to nurse her back to health. And over those four weeks, although it was a little bit touch and go and it was incredibly difficult time for Susan, she did survive and she did make a recovery to the point where she could actually get out of the bath and start moving around the house again. Whilst Susan was recovering, Teresa told the girls that they needed to come up with some kind of cover story so that if anyone ever asked Susan what had happened to her, she could give them this story. And so she said the cover story would be that Sheila, the eldest of the daughters, had accidentally stabbed Susan in the chest with a knife. Ridiculous, but that's the story she came up with and told the daughters that they had to go along with it. And throughout this time, Teresa's unable to hold down a steady job. She's not able to support her family. She's not able to support the running of a house. And so she decides to move in with her sister, Rosemary. Rosemary agreed and the family moved in with her, but it wasn't long before another murder would happen to someone very close to Teresa and the police would question whether she had anything to do with it. The sister, Rosemary, was found dead at the side of a road, having been strangled to death. The case to this day remains unsolved, and with no evidence linking Teresa to the crime, she has never been convicted of it or even questioned on it. And so I suppose we'll never know who really murdered Rosemary. But what I will say is that after that, straight after Rosemary had died, obviously Teresa 
was able to live in her house and she was able to do whatever she wanted with the children now that she was alone with them. She continued to have this rage against Susan and she handcuffed her to the bed where she'd leave her just for days, sometimes weeks at a time, all the while telling the other children that Susan was a witch and she needed to be punished. This was her form of punishment and she brought it on herself. Susan knew she was on the edge of death she had been for some time and her siblings knew it too. She needed to do whatever she could to try and escape this hell. And although she'd thought she'd tried everything that she could, she realized there was one thing, it was a mad idea, but there was one thing that she hadn't done yet. And that was ask for her mum's consent to leave the house. She told her mum that she was nearly 18 years old and she wanted to leave. She said that if her mum could buy her a one-way ticket to Alaska, she'd leave and never return. Surely something that Teresa wanted, given that she tried to kill her just months before. And surprisingly, Teresa agreed on one condition. She said that she wasn't convinced Susan wouldn't leave the house and go straight to the police. She'd gone before, she could do it again, and this time there was a bullet in her. And so they would be able to find that she'd been shot, they would listen to her claims, and then Teresa may get arrested for it. And so she said the only way that she would let Susan go was if Susan allowed her to remove that bullet and then she'd be free. Susan obviously didn't have much of a choice, so she agreed. Teresa brought out some old tools, a, a makeshift hospital of different kinds of knives and anything else she could find that might be able to help remove that bullet. She gave Susan some Thyora design, which is a medication used to treat schizophrenia, and some alcohol to wash it down with. This particular medication has side effects that include making you drowsy and dizzy if mixed with alcohol. Likely something Teresa was counting on, given what happened just a few days later. And it can also make you prone to infection. It took a little over two hours for Teresa to find the bullet, and despite the horrific nature of the surgery, Susan did manage to get through it and the bullet was removed, but Susan became extremely unwell over the next day or two. The bullet wound that Teresa had quote operated on had become badly infected and she was getting more and more poorly by the day. By this point, Teresa was beginning to get annoyed with the inconvenience of having a very sick child. Susan was lying in the middle of the room, by now unable to move because of the sepsis she'd developed. And whenever the siblings or Teresa passed her, they'd literally have to step over her. Teresa decided to take her two young sons and Susan in the car and drive to a nearby stream. Once they arrived, Teresa made uh, the two young sons take Susan out of the car and place her on the ground next to the stream. She told Billy Bob and Robert that because Susan was possessed by the devil, the only way to purge her body of that was with fire. And then she made one of the sons flick the lighter on and onto Susan's body, which by this point, Teresa had doused in gasoline. And so she died. And then at 4.30 a.m. that following morning, that passerby walked and saw this fire and uh, called emergency services and they recovered Susan's body, which at this point they identified as Jane Doe due to the lack of any identification on her. Meanwhile, back at the house, Teresa turned her focus to her eldest daughter, Sheila. She started making her go out and work on the streets doing sex work and any money that she got from her clients, she would have to give straight to Teresa. Teresa was still accusing Sheila of things that were completely untrue. At this point, she said that Sheila was pregnant by one of her uh, sex work clients and that she had an STI. And even though both of these things were proven to be untrue by doctors, Teresa said that it still was true. True. None of this mattered. It didn't matter that Sheila didn't have an STI. Teresa wanted to control the narrative and so she said she would only stop hurting Sheila if she told her what the cure to her STI that she did not have was. After all of that, she went on to tie Sheila up in a boiling hot, tiny cupboard with shelves in it so she couldn't even sit down or make herself 
remotely comfortable and she would leave her there for hours, sometimes days at a time. At one point, Sheila tried to tell her mum what the cure was to this fake STI that she didn't have, just to be able to be let out of the cupboard, but this answer wasn't good enough for her mum and so she left Sheila in that cupboard. And when she would hear her screams and cries to be let out, the response to that from Teresa was just to turn up the TV and ignore her. Sheila eventually stopped making any noises. Her siblings weren't able to do anything to help her for fear of being punished with her. And Sheila soon died from a combination of things. She was without water and food for days, locked in this hot, humid, tiny space and was extremely dehydrated and exhausted. She was just 20 years old. Teresa then had to decide what to do with Sheila's body and her first instinct was to say that she was going to dismember the body to make it easier to get rid of but she did eventually decide against this and instead bundled Sheila's body into a cardboard box, put it in the car and then drove to a spot nearby. Again, she made her sons help her do this. They had driven to this spot nearby to where they had previously dumped Susan's body but this time Teresa decided not to set the body on fire because she, she didn't want them to be linked. She didn't want the murders to be able to be linked together. When Sheila's body was discovered a few days later, there was nothing on her identifying her and so she was entered into the system as another Jane Doe. When the officers looked for any sorts of missing persons reports that would match her, they obviously didn't find anything because Teresa hadn't reported her as missing. Even so, Teresa was incredibly paranoid that Sheila and Susan's murders would be linked and she'd be found out. And she decided the only way to ensure this wasn't gonna happen was to get rid of any evidence. And this meant she wanted to burn down her sister Rosemary's house where they were all living. And she made her children help, they burnt down the house and then they all left. Terry, the youngest daughter, was 15 years old by this point and she knew that she needed to escape. If she didn't, she would be next. She left home and started working the streets and during this time she became addicted to drugs but she was determined to get justice for her sisters and see her mum behind bars. Terry actually went to see a lawyer and told this lawyer about what had happened to her as a child, the abuse she'd suffered, and what had happened to her two sisters. And um, for some reason, the lawyer didn't take this any further. This could have been a number of things. It might have been lack of evidence, or it might have been that the lawyer just simply didn't believe Terry's story. The fact that a mother had killed two of her own children and abused the other siblings and never been found out was too unbelievable. After that, Terry decided to start trying to rebuild her life and she ended up getting married, but in the cycle of violence, breeding violence, she was uh, abusive towards her husband. And she also found out that because of the abuse she'd suffered from her mum, when her mum had punched her in the stomach a number of times incredibly hard. She had actually uh, learned recently that she was infertile. The details that Terry had given to the officer were passed on to another department so that they could look into the claims and validate their authenticity. But when they looked into them further and got in contact with the local police forces in those areas, they didn't come across anything that matched with what Terry had told them. And with that, they decided to just dismiss her claims. But Terry wouldn't give up. And it was around three years later on the 27th of September, 1993, that Terry made a phone call to the police department again. At this point, she was 23 years old. This time, the officer who dealt with Terry's call was able to identify an unsolved case that matched what Terry had said. The reason they hadn't been able to find it three years earlier was because the officer who had chased it up had accidentally inquired at the wrong county police department. They were looking in the wrong area, so they were never going to find what they were looking for. For the few years between Terry leaving her mum, aged 15, and now reporting the crimes to the police again, Teresa had moved around quite a lot. She was continuously moving around because she was worried about getting caught for those murders. And as she'd moved around, she'd ended up at some point ditching both of her sons, so it was just her. And eventually she settled on living in Utah. 
When she had settled in Utah, she ended up working as a carer for an elderly woman, and by all accounts, it was reported that she was kind and seemed to have a genuine connection with the person that she cared for. She seemed warm and open, a stark contrast to the 30 years previously where she had abused her children. Meanwhile, as the investigation was amping up, a warrant was issued for Teresa's arrest, but no one knew where she was at. It took some time because she had moved about so frequently, but they did eventually track her down and arrested her. And she, of course, denied all wrongdoing and pleaded not guilty. But what Teresa didn't know was that as part of the investigation, the investigating team had tracked down her two youngest sons, Robert and Billy Bob. Robert was not hard to find. He was already in prison for a murder that had happened a few years earlier. He had gone into a bar with the sole intention of robbing it, and he'd ended up shooting and killing the bartender, and so he was serving a 16-year sentence at a prison. Billy Bob, however, had made quite the life for himself. Once he had left that house of horrors, He'd gotten a girlfriend, held down a steady job, and by all accounts, he was living quite a nice life. But when police questioned him, he denied knowing anything about the murders. However, he did corroborate the abuse that had happened in the home. He blamed Sheila and Susan for their own disappearances, saying that they'd been doing sex work and had led risky lifestyles. Billy Bob and Robert were also charged as accomplices to the murders, but they both said they'd been forced to comply with their mum's requests. If they didn't, they'd be killed too. And that they genuinely both believed that their sisters were possessed by the devil and there was no other choice but to eliminate them. Both men took a plea deal and agreed to testify against Teresa at trial. As part of that deal, Billy Bob was given probation and Robert was given three years, which he served alongside his murder sentence for that bar robbery. So it didn't add any actual time onto his sentence. On hearing that both of her sons and her daughter Terry were planning on testifying against her, Teresa decided not to risk getting the death penalty. And so she pleaded guilty to the murders. She was sentenced to life in prison. And even though she did plead guilty, she still to this day denies any wrongdoing. In 2011, Terry died from heart failure aged just 41 years old. Her obituary says that she leaves behind a loving companion Raymond and a brother Robert. It seems that she may have found a way to have Robert back in her life, but it doesn't say anything about Billy Bob. It was reported that when Billy Bob was initially arrested for being an accomplice to murder, he falsely claimed that Terry was in the car with them and should be facing the same consequences as him. As for Teresa, she will live out the rest of her life in prison unless she gets parole. And I've seen it reported in different places as to the year that could be. She's already been denied it once, but her next parole date is in 2024. So she could be released then, but it doesn't seem likely. Thank you for watching this episode of Red Rum. Uh, This case was a listener case suggestion. So thank you to Sweet Petunia, username, uh, for this case. If you have a case suggestion, whack it down below. I'm making a list and if there's enough source material, I will try and cover it for sure. Other than that, if you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button. um, Subscribe if you're not subscribed. And also, if you are part of any true crime groups, be it on Facebook, be it on Instagram. Social media is a really massive platform for sharing. So please do consider copying that link and sharing it with your true crime friends. And I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.